This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Hi everybody, thank you. Before I tell you a little bit about my research on resource unpredictability, socialization, and warfare, I just want to give you a little bit of information about my own background and how I came to do this research. Um, I actually have a long-standing interest in peace, not in war, which goes back to my high school days as a protester against nuclear weapons and uh, the threat, the so-called threat of the Soviet Union, which ironically uh, seems to have reared itself again. Um, but many of my colleagues, unfortunately, consider that if you're interested in warfare, then you must like it. And I just want to iterate to the contrary. It's something I actually detest. It's really hard to read about. Um, but it is my belief that if you want to do something about any phenomenon that occurs in the, hu in the human condition, you have to do research to understand it in a systematic way. I, I do want to mention briefly uh, some research I did as part of my PhD dissertation when I did field work in, in Western Kenya um, that is relevant to the issue of aggression in males. I ended up doing a behavioral observational study of three groups of children, girls, boys who were assigned girls work because their mothers didn't have any daughters at the time, and um, boys who didn't do girls work. I was interested in the origin of sex differences, gender differences, and it turned out that boys who did girls work, mostly babysitting, were, uh, based on behavior observations, were uh, in the middle between other boys and girls. They were significantly less aggressive, they were significantly more responsible, and significantly less egoistic. Um, and that earlier study, in many ways, influenced my uh, interest and partial belief that so much of male aggression is learned. But for most of my career, I have put my passion really into doing what I call cross-cultural research, which has many different meanings. But I mean systematic cross-cultural research that tries to test hypotheses uh, against data from usually worldwide samples of societies. One of the main ways that this is facilitated is by the database that um, was put together by the Human Relations Area Files. Uh, that's the institution I'm pleased to be president of at the current time. So one of the main goals of cross-cultural research is to systematically test theories against the anthropological record. And theories, of course, are explanations that purport to say why customs or cultural traits vary. Cross-culturalists make the assumption that if a theory has merit, at the very least, the presumed causes and the presumed effects should be correlated. Every society in a cross-cultural study has a time and a place focus, which in my view gives an ethnographic snapshot of the culture at a particular time, at a particular place. Now, in contrast to many anthropologists, 
Uh, most cross-culturalists, and I do not assume that cultures are unchanging. Cultures can change very quickly, and you can see that even if you look within the ethnographic record, it, even over 30 years, uh, you see very different descriptions by anthropologists who go at different times. Uh, Cross-culturalists assume that there's heterogeneity within a society, and that's why we're very careful to measure variables for one community, let's say, at a specific time period, and all the variables are measured for that time period. But basically, the fundamental assumption is that if there's law-like relationships between things, any kinds of things, they should hold no matter what time, no matter what place. It should hold in the past, it should hold in the present, it should hold 50 years before, 100 years before. So each culture that's described in a cross-cultural study is not studied for the same time across cultures, and that's because anthropologists go to different places at different times. We just don't have that kind of historical data. But each one has its own focus. So in this research that I'll be telling you about, I start, we started with a worldwide sample of 186 societies. Uh, this, is a, this is based on a sample very commonly used in cross-cultural research now called the Standard Cross-Cultural Sample. It was chosen to be representative of pre-industrial societies. And wherever possible, because it makes research so much easier, we use the Haraf collection of ethnography, now E. Haraf World Cultures. So, by society, I do not mean countries. We're talking about groups that anthropologists normally study. So we would include groups like the Maasai, the Somali. Uh, in Europe, the rural Irish, not uh, industrial Ireland, but the Balinese, Samoans, Pawnee, and the Aztec, who lived alone from a long time ago. So the, just giving you examples of the kind of societies that are studied. To uh, do the research, we read reports from observers, usually anthropologists, who lived in the community for a year or more, often more. We look for reports about traditional warfare or the lack thereof for time periods prior to forced pacification, usually by more powerful groups, uh, such as colonial authorities. Now, I should say that uh, I have a very different definition of, the, of warfare from what I, Chris Bohm, for example, described, in that uh, we did not make the distinction between feuding or raiding or warfare. Warfare, in our sense, is armed combat between communities, from a community on up. Um, I, we decided deliberately, and by the way, I'm referring to research with my late husband, Melvin Ember. We decided um, deliberately not to look at why people said they were fighting. Um, we, what we wanted to focus on was what did people actually do when they were fighting. Um, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. We have reason to think that what people say, because it often doesn't correspond to what they do, is maybe very misleading. If you ask people in the United States, why do we go to war, we say to go to war to make peace, which is the most ludicrous thing <laughs> I've ever heard. But basically, we're using data from other researchers um, for the starting with 186 societies, looking at rating to try to rate frequency of warfare and other forms of aggression. And most importantly, uh, we rated resource problems. Uh, but we were trying to test a variety of theories about warfare um, in, uh, in research which was supported by the National Science Foundation. So we used data also from other researchers for, the cent for information on childhood socialization, societal complexity, and other attributes. Now this is, some of this is based on our research and others is based on other researchers' research, but I just wanted to give you a picture, a cross-cultural picture worldwide, of the kinds of variables that are related to each other. And you can see that warfare um, is correlated with higher, higher warfare is correlated with higher homicide, higher assault, wife beating, training children, particularly boys, to be aggressive, aggressive sports, including sham combat, severe punishment of criminals, and um, 
I, I know this has become more popular in our society, but uh, cross-culturally, any kind of body alteration which is painful, such as tattooing or piercing, is correlated with warfare. So uh, this raises the question of, is there a culture of violence if all these things are correlated with each other? And if there is a culture of violence, what is, what is the driver of the pattern? Um, I think there are two likely theories. One is that we train, a culture, a society trains boys particularly to be aggressive, and because they train them to be aggressive, as adults, all kinds of aggressive behaviors are exhibited. The second theory would be that warfare is the driver, the central driver, and that it in turn pushes parents to train their boys to be aggressive, and that in turn uh, produces other patterns of violence, some of which are unintended. Now, our evidence does suggest that it's the second theory that has more merit. Um, it's a little bit complicated to explain um, some of the reasons why, but I will try. Basically, um, the, the reason why we think there's evidence that socialization for aggression, which is in the middle, is a consequence of war, not a cause of it, is that first, socialization for aggression strongly predicts homicide and assault cross-culturally. But more importantly, uh, a major piece of evidence is that societies that are pacified as of the time of, their, of the anthropologist study are significantly less likely to socialize boys to be aggressive than societies that are not pacified. Now, one might argue that could it be that the reason that the societies were pacified by colonial powers was because they were less aggressive in the first place and they were more readily pacified. But to check this possibility, we compared societies pacified 10 years before and those compared, uh, pacified 30 years after anthropologists were there. And um, both sets were able to be pacified, but socialization for aggression was only lower for the ones pacified earlier consistent with the idea that pacification lowered parental interest in socializing for aggression. Um, I should note, I think, uh, anecdotally anyway, uh, Germany and Japan are very good instances of um, dropping interest in socializing for aggression in boys after being defeated in, during World War II. So if warfare is the driver, what explains radiation in warfare frequency. In our research, we tried to test, we tried to test um, theories about conditions which might increase the likelihood of warfare. Uh, those theories, briefly, are that simpler societies, like most, the thought was hunter-gatherers, uh, which um, may have less to fight about, uh, and more complex societies, particularly agricultural societies, have, have good, good um, land that might be conducive to fighting. Another theory is uh, punitive or harsh socialization of children, uh, that this may lead psychologically to uh, imitating uh, adults uh, and lead to more violence as adults. Low need satisfaction has to do with uh, not having very affectionate parenting and uh, having a, a rather frustrating childhood. Protest masculinity, theory suggests that in societies where there's more conflict about sex, sexual identification in boys, uh, they will try to display more hyper-masculine behavior to show how man, manly they are. Uh, some have postulated fighting over women as the main driver, uh, and uh, others that it's population pressure on resources. So, our, most importantly, we needed to try to come up with measures of population pressure on resources. We were able to get measures of cultural complexity, punitive socialization, uh, low need satisfaction in infancy, et cetera, from other researchers. But we set about to study, to try to measure resource problems. And we focused, we decided the best tactic 
was to evaluate whether people had overreached their ecological carrying capacity because it was impossible to know how much carrying capacity there actually might be. So we focused on three measures of resource scarcity, threat of famine, how many famines in the 25 years prior to the anthropological study were there, threat of natural disasters that just seriously destroyed food supplies, how many in a 25 year time period. Drought, for example, is a major natural disaster, could be floods. Chronic scarcity, how many are people um, don't have enough to eat normally? Are there hungry times of the year when there's not enough to eat? What we were amazed at, actually, was that all these things that we looked at, there were only two things that seemed to predict warfare well at all. We didn't find support for cultural complexity, for punitive socialization, for protest masculinity, nor fighting over women. The, the major predictor by itself, natural disasters that destroy food supply, we call this resource unpredictability. And um, the reason is, the reason we're calling it unpredictability is pretty simple. Most natural disasters don't occur all the time. They might occur twice in a 25 year period. And the fascinating thing was that uh, it, when you look at a society's warfare pattern, those that had unpredictable natural disasters, they did not just fight when there were disasters or shortly thereafter. They were fighting all the time. Um, the other major predictor, but wasn't nearly as major, with a correlation of like 0.26, was socializing children to mistrust others. So those were our main findings. Uh, I just want to point out to you some other evidence which it does seem to support the theory that resource unpredictability is the main uh, driver, possibly, of warfare. So some evidence from archaeology, some historical evidence, some meta-analyses. This, um, Steve Lexon is an archaeologist who actually amazingly tried to take our theory put forward uh, from worldwide research and test it in the archaeological record of the US Southwest. One of the things I need to tell you to understand Steve Lexon's result is the reason we suggest, we suggested that it wasn't actual resource population pressure or resource shortage, it was fear of loss of resources, as I mentioned, was because of the fact that they were fighting even when there was no actual shortage as well. These two graphs, the graph shows the, the brown is resource unpredictability measured by tree ring data, the, the red is in periods of warfare, which suggests remarkable correspondence in the U.S. Southwest. Patricia Lambert talked about uh, coastal Southern California, and as she mentioned, there was more higher uh, evidence of violent conflict in the period characterized by drought. This is from Korea, showing correspondence between environmental stressors and, and warfare frequency. There was only one time period when they didn't correspond very well. This is uh, from Bong Kang. And uh, there has been recently a meta-analysis of published in Science in 2013 by Solomon Siang, I don't know how to pronounce his name, H-S-I-A-N-G, who looked at 30, 60 studies with conflict data, set, different conflict data sets, ranging from interpersonal violence to intergroup violence, and he found that um, there was a remarkable uh, increase in any kind of violence whatsoever with deviations from normal precipitation and uh, deviations in temperature in, in, the, in his meta-analysis. Finally, uh, let me just summarize and say that um, in my opinion, the, the warfare does not appear to be intrinsic to the human condition. If it were, we'd find as much in societies with stable resources as unstable resources. We suggest that parents socialize for aggression if they perceive their sons and sometimes daughters will go up, grow up in a world with warfare and they need to prepare them for it. Socialization for aggression, unfortunately, probably engenders more violence. 
And unfortunately, I think everybody seems to think that climate change is going to make things worse. So violence may become more likely, not less. If we want to end violence, we probably need to work harder to eliminate warfare. But we have to want to. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Carol. And many people have set me up by hinting that culture has a role in violence and nonviolence. And what I want to do in these few minutes is to take the issue head on. So in 1985, when I first went to work with the Enga of New Guinea, the local people recommended that I work in a bucolic clan in the Ambum Valley, Valley very peaceful. The clans hadn't fought for 25 years. They went to school together. They went to church together. They socialized. They intermarried. And um, I thought, this is a really good starter clan. And it really was a jump starter clan. Because after I'd worked there for eight months, um, there was a tussle in the valley bottom. One person was very severely injured from the clan I was working. The clan held their meeting, their men's meeting. Each person expressed his opinion, and they decided to go to war. And the process, I was able to be in and part of the process, not in the meetings, but later. Um, the process was that they first dehumanized the enemy and turned into enemy people they had married and gone to church with and gone to school with. And they sang all kinds of taunting songs like, your girls are not like ours. Their skins are like crocodile skins. They have pandanus thorns embedded in their vaginas. And their hair is as red as the clay of Nomala. Our boys are afraid to touch the skins of your sisters and daughters. You can go pay bride wealth to your own girls and marry all of them, implying incest. So these sessions went on taunting until they had established the two sides and brotherhood within the two sides. And um, after that, they went to war. And in the first days of the war, it was great, because they were fighting with bow and arrow, not guns then. So you could take your sandwich and go sit on the hillside and go to a war. <laughs> and um, it was like a football game, exactly the cadence at the beginning, or a soccer game, you know, of everybody cheering. And then as soon as someone killed, the anger set in, and the whole sound of the war was completely different. Um, then they fought for about a few months. Three people were killed, and the area was completely devastated, as you can see. And they realized this is futile, and they started peace proceedings, and they gave compensation, and they shared food. And by sharing food, they made each other human again. So um, all humans have this potential for aggression and reconciliation. And it's really cultural institutions. And by that, I only mean norms, beliefs, rules, and practices that generate some regularity of behavior. This is necessary for cooperation to have some understanding, regularity of behavior. And they modify aggression in all societies. What they really do is they structure cognition, how people see the situation, how people mentally represent their experiences, and in turn, release certain emotional responses. These cultural institutions are constantly updated um, to new circumstances. So in this case, cultural institutions bonded fighters and dehumanized the enemy. And they also provided a framework of exchange to make peace possible. Because as the saying goes, justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done. I must say, a lot of the justice that happens in Papua New Guinea, I don't see it as justice done. But anyway, cultural difference. So the, I think the central question we should be asking is not, are humans aggressive? But how are aggression and affiliation harnessed by cultural means to the benefit and detriment of human societies? Um, and what did differential success in harnessing aggression mean for our political evolution. We know that cultural control of aggression can make or break a society. Some societies get caught in the war trap, and they just go downhill. So here are some ideas of what vi um, coalitional violence can achieve. It can um, build male alliances vis-a-vis -vis an external enemy. It can establish a balance of power for intergroup exchange. 
can build reputations for individuals who are fight leaders or peace leaders. It can forge intergroup alliances against someone else. So the political potential is great if it's handled in certain ways. So um, I, I left out a word here, how do groups handle aggression? So I'm going to compare the two societies I've worked with for over 30 years. One are the Enga of Papua New Guinea, and they harness coalitionary violence for economic goals. And then the Kong Bushmen, hunter-gatherers of Botswana and Namibia, and they really reject violence, and they disperse in the face of conflict to avoid violence. So let's compare them. So um, the Kong uh, territories lack sufficient water um, for survival in many years. From here up to the top of the map is about 400 kilometers. And these lines here show the exchange partners of one person and all the places they can go in times of hardship. There are only about five reliable water points in this area. People are forced to move all the time to distribute themselves over resources, and they have to maintain networks and social ties to do this. And this is a picture of a lady wearing her beads, and these are gifts from all her partners, and she's flaunting her social ties because she's trying to marry off her grandson. And so the Kong create um, networks of mutual access to alternate residences, and by that way they maintain a high mobility, but they have few cultural means to deal with aggression. They have no club fights like the Eche. Um, they avoid aggression, and when it does break out, people do fight. They get the fellow by the arms, and they literally put him in a straitjacket so the body's wanting to fight, but the limbs can't move. And then after that, they disperse by voting with their feet and go live apart till things cool. But sometimes this happens too quickly, and arrows fly, people die, including the bystanders. Um, so the reasons for the conflicts, not surprising, is women, psychopaths, and, and in such societies where there's little violence, they, they hesitate to, to take out psychopaths until it's too late, hate, revenge, Resources very few and unknown causes. I don't know the causes of all fights. So I'm going to just tell you some sort of, a few stories of homicide that this old man Klingla told me to give you an idea of what it's like. So first of all is a chaotic response to violence. This, this man Klaus stabbed his lovely wife Shuko with a poison arrow out of jealousy. And the story goes, in the morning before sunrise, she cried, ooh, ee, I'm dying. Clow, the boastful one, has killed me. Clow returns to the scene, and he provokes him. Have you perhaps seen Clow, the boastful one? Well, here I am, he said to his wife. And what did I tell you yesterday about not going to another man's fire? And now you are saying, ooh, and dying. In a rage, her brothers pursue him. You will die with your foreskin pulled back. You all, we will catch Clow, the boy, boastful one, so he can shit on himself. They jumped up and chased him. Go die, ejaculate on themselves. And then there comes this long story for 10 minutes about dodging and chasing and chaos. And in the end, Clow takes off. He lives elsewhere, and the story ends. Nobody killed him. He eventually died by himself. So you can see there's very little control, cultural controls of aggression here. Another story is of Sam Kao, who was a notorious killer, and he killed a revered elder. This is a psychopath, clearly. And a couple men go after him, they shoot him, and he has nowhere to go, so he comes home to the people who shot him. And the story goes, wounded, Sam Kao really cried. He cried because he was miserable. His uncle, who was supposed to feel sorry for him, just spoke angrily. Sam Kao, his uncle said, and Sam Kao said, uncle, do not talk like that. And his granny, his granny old Nuka said, why are you crying? Just sit down and die, for you're too crazy to live. He refuted, poison will not kill me. Okay, and then the next one is after his death, these people had to go back to the place where his mother lived to get water. Did you kill him, the people asked? Yes, we killed him. If you killed him, it's all right. He was killing all of you. Yes, he was killing all of us. He was such a strange thing. This is repeated for about five minutes, showing the guilt people feel of killing a kinsman. And his mother was there and said, even if he's dead, it doesn't matter. He was not normal. We're not going to blame each other. 
We do not even have to say that the one who used to be alive is now dead. Instead, we're going to live on. And so the story goes on. So you can see there's a strong cultural tendency to repress revenge, because if you had revenge, people could not move around with resources. But unfortunately, because there are no means to do with violence, no cultural means, the, the homicide rates are high. 111 homicides per person per year. In the US in the 1990s, it was 9.8. Pinker's fi figures for tribal societies are 800 per 100,000. And the Semai, who are the most peaceful people, 30 out of 100. So they're high just because there's no way to manage them. Who's killed? Close family, close in-laws, others in camp nearby, very few in other groups. Revenge, it's often taken immediately in the same fight, but if not, only in a few cases, mostly of psychopaths, is it delayed, and there are a number of cases where it's, I, they know of no revenge. There's no evidence of war. So the outcomes is a wonderfully peaceful daily life with very little aggression. And when I lived at the community of Klekai in 74, about 150 people lived there. There were no physical injuries from violence, not one. Many heated arguments, seven um, physical fights in which people were straitjacketed. Mobility was maintained. The downside of this is there are no male alliances, corporate groups, and they're losing their land to ethnic, other ethnic groups. Now, I'll move on to the anger of Papua New Guinea. Um, the two places could not be more different. Highland horticulturalist organized into clans and tribes, strong corporate group alliances, um, highly competitive wealth exchanges, which are fueled by wealth from outside. So they have both a corporate group strategy and, like the Bushmen, a network strategy made on the basis of female ties. And war is used to bond corporate groups and establish balance of power so that the wealth can flow. They have many institutions to bond corporate groups. You can see at the bottom of the picture, men at a very early age go live in the men's house where they learn clan history, where all the men circulate from the clan, they bond. Then on the right side, they have bachelor's cults, which bonds a cohort. They have clan meetings where every man gives his opinion about the war. Will it hurt me? Do I want war? And the clan members support each other from cradle to grave, agriculture, house building, bride wealth, defense, funerals, all of these things. On the other hand, you have cultural institutions to support the networks with other groups and many exchanges to celebrate mother's kin and in-laws. Warfare is for men only because if you kill women, that kills the networks because they're made on the basis of marriage ties. There are rules that contain warfare so they don't get furious, and there's peacemaking after all wars. And um, so when a man was, th these are some of the feelings that are generated of brotherhood by these institutions. When a man was killed, the killers, the clan of the killers sang songs of bravery and victory. <clears throat> Their land would be like a high mountain, and that's how it was down through the generation. The member of the deceased clan would become small. They would be nothing. But when they had avenged the deaths of their brothers, their heart would be open because they had gotten back on an, evil, on an equal footing. So that explains these, these institutions generate a need for revenge. And another thing the brotherhood generated People fight also for brotherhood. Fighting is like eating pork, sweet. If you don't want to fight, never start, because after one war, fighting will get in your blood. You will not want to stop the excitement, the brotherhood, the desire for revenge for the death of your brothers. So these are the feelings generated by cultural institutions that so contrast with the Bushmen, um, who don't have these institutions. And the last one is they have peace exchanges and reconciliation. And um, here's a quote from a man, all things happen because of the tongue, the uncontrollable tongue that ought not to have said certain things. One must say soothing words to the victim's clan. After you had comforted the victim's clan with words, you must give them food at any opportunity. So this is formal institutions again with formal speech, 
to um, change emotions. So the anger homicide right, um, rates, and these guys are pretty high up in the War Department. They fought a lot in the past. The warfare is 183 per 100,000 per year. The Kung was 122. Intra-clan homicide, 69. This is mostly brothers fighting over family land. Inter-clan homicide, 115. There's a lot of pig theft, and that's what it's about. And the total is 367, which is way below um, Kim's figure for the Hiwi and Eche. Why? Because they have peacemaking and because they maintain a corporate and network strategy. So the outcomes um, there, frequent violence in daily life. I mean, Bushman life is wonderful without violence. In this community where I worked for the six months before war, there were 86 incidents of violence with non-lethal physical injury, like people's earlobes being bitten, someone chopped with a bush knife. Um, the upside was the war and peacemaking. They promote balances of power. And in the last 200 years, you had, before contact with Europeans, you had the rise of these vast pig exchange systems involving over 40,000 people. This political organization has developed strong leadership, which you can see in the Engen's influence in the modern national politics. So they have used aggression partly for their benefit. Um, and then I just wanted to end with the fact that cultural institutions change with context. People are pushing the envelope of the rules all the time. So the Kung homicide rates in Nai Nai have now gone down recently to 29 per 100,000 and Anga 51 per 100,000. People always say this is the state. In fact, most of this is not the state. The state doesn't care about these people. These are the people themselves changing their indigenous institutions, mingling them with state institutions to come into the modern world. So finally, the question is, what's culture got to do with it? My answer would be a great deal. Culture structures cognition, emotion, and responses. It's essential for understanding the past, the present, and building a less violent future. Thank you. It's always difficult to be the last speaker at a session like this because, um, well, first of all, I'm the only thing standing between you and dinner, right? Uh, but also you run the risk of everyone having already said all the interesting points, right? Uh, but we've heard a lot about hunter-gatherers today and uh, we've questioned things about human nature and so we might ask this question. Do hunter-gatherers tell us about human nature? In a word, no. And in two words, yes, but. Not any more than anyone else, like anthropologists or geneticists or cognitive scientists. You see, hunter-gatherers are just like you and me, only different. They're like you and me because they operate with the same minds and the same intellectual potentials as you and me. They're different because they use those minds in very different uh, environments, social and cultural circumstances. So yes, hunter-gatherers have something to say about human nature. After all, they're humans. But many people think that hunter-gatherers offer special insight into human nature. Why is this? People know that a long, long time ago, everyone lived as hunter-gatherers. And some think if we could go back in time to when humans first appeared, that we might see human nature in the raw. For some people, going back in time is like going deeper into humanity's soul. And for some, that soul is all Rousseauian sweetness and light, and for others, it's a Hobbesian hell. Neither of these gentlemen actually knew anything about hunter-gatherers or even knew of the existence of hunter-gatherers. Hunter there's, a, there's a problem, though. If you want to study the past, you have to do archaeology. And archaeology isn't rocket science. In fact, it's a lot harder. <laughs> it's difficult to infer human behavior, let alone human nature, from the few uh, bones and stone tools 
that survive what Sir Francis Bacon called the shipwreck of time. And so many people turn away from archeology span to uh, ethnography, thinking that living hunter-gatherers are as close as we can get to the past. For them, uh, this might be prehistory and a privileged gl glimpse into human nature. Both statements are incorrect. Living hunter-gatherers aren't Stone Age relics. They live in the present, the globalized market system with insurgencies, cell phones, McDonald's, Facebook, and Starbucks. Madagascar's Mikea, for example, can't be Stone Age relics since Madagascar was colonized very late in world prehistory by Indonesian and later African horticulturalists. The name Mikea may come from the expression ulusi mekiea, which means people who don't like to be followed. Some two centuries ago and more, Mikea fled into the forest to uh, escape the slave uh, trade. And they did so again in the 1960s to escape the fledgling Malagasy government's tax collectors. In the late 20th century, uh, the Mikea grew and sold maize to traders. It was a Pakistani man who drove this truck, who then sold that maize on the world livestock feed market. The Mikea moved along tracks uh, in their forests created by oil companies in the 1950s. In the 1990s, they listened to music on radios and cassette players and played top 10 hits on homemade guitars. These guys here uh, uh, could uh, give uh, Eric Clapton a run for his money. <laughs> you can't ignore those facts, as some filmmakers have done, and think that you understand how the Mikea would live if they were really hunter-gatherers and nothing more. A second reason is that if we think that hunter-gatherers reflect human nature, my first question would be, which ones? We can justify any vision of human nature simply by appealing to the right group at the right time. If you want a noble savage view of humanity, you might pick the uh, mid to late 20th century foragers of Southern Africa, often portrayed as uh, sort of Rousseauian hippies. But if you picked 19th century hunter-gatherers who lived on North America's Northwest Coast, the Kwakwakwak, the Shimshin, or the Tlingit, uh, with their socially stratified villages that fought for prestige, slaves, and land, you'd come up with the Hobbesian road warrior. You can imagine if somebody could go back in time to the Chumash during the medieval warm period, they'd have a very different ethnography than if they went there three or 4,000 year years ago. So which one of these is right? Well, of course, they both are. Hunter-gatherers are capable of both these extremes. Societies are collections of individuals, but they're more than the sum of their parts. As individuals, as we saw here today, there are biological, psychological, and environmental uh, circumstances that might incline us to be more Hitler or Mother Teresa. But what determines which way we go as a society. To address this question anthropologically, we have to turn away from looking for the essential hunter-gatherer and just look at behavioral variation. And today, we're interested in violence. Hunter-gatherers don't live lives of perfect bliss. You've seen that today. In fact, you've seen some pretty gruesome examples of it. But they generally have low rates of non-lethal aggression, such as fistfights. This isn't because they're good people. The reason has to do with the cultural denial of aggression in small egalitarian communities. And um, incidentally, I, I see this all the time when I run uh, archeological field crews out in the mountains. When Jean Briggs entitled her 1970 book on an Inuit family, Never in Anger, she didn't mean that the Inuit are never angry, only that it's inappropriate to show it. But in small communities, you will tread on other people's toes and sometimes pent up tensions erupt, the reactive uh, violence. And that resulting violence often has no objective other than to express anger, and sometimes that anger can turn into blood drunkenness and someone can die as a result of rage, but not the calculated risk of proactive violence. And warfare is different because it is calculated risk. 
We can define it as uh, simply relatively impersonal lethal aggression between communities. Impersonal doesn't mean that warriors aren't passionate. And in fact, if leaders want to, uh, the the leaders will need to inspire uh, passion in their followers if they want those men to put their lives on the line and to kill someone. War is nasty business. And while its superficial goal is revenge or retaliation, I suspect that for a group to be compelled to fight, the goal must also be to secure some advantage, to acquire slaves, women, food, territory, or to make a preemptive strike. Sometimes the source of these conflicts can sound so silly that they can seem to reinforce the stereotype that men will fight over damn near anything. Here's one case from North America's northwest coast. The Akutat Tlingit attacked the Sitka Tlingit because the Sitka had outsang the Yakutak for two years in a row. That's right, it's a fight over a DJ's playlist. But those songs were a, a mere index for a far more significant fact. To retaliate after the first embarrassment, the Yakutat had learned songs from a neighboring group. But the Sitka, I suppose figuring what, out what the Yakutat would do, had also increased their repertoire with songs from the Aleut. It's not the songs that mattered, but that the songs are evidence of friendly connections with others. They were an index of uh, allies. With their more extensive playlist, the Sitka proclaimed themselves once again more powerful than the Yakutat. The Yakutat had no, strike, uh, no choice but to strike preemptively or risk being perceived as weak and vulnerable. Uh, violence is one option that humans can use to reach an objective. But like all options, it comes with a cost. And it can be a steep one. You could lose what you have, you could get hurt, or you could die. And even when successful, violence comes with a cost. It makes enemies, and it drains resources that could be devoted to other activities. You solve one immediate problem, but you create other longer-term ones. When is the cost of violence worth the benefit? The answer almost certainly has to do with population pressure, which we've already seen uh, today. Most nomadic hunter-gatherers follow Ronald Reagan's advice and vote with their feet. When things go bad in their neighborhood, a drought, a range fire, illness, their first response is to pack up and move. And food is a special concern because the problem of eating is, is an immediate one. This means that we might expect warfare to be more common among sedentary than among nomadic hunter-gatherers, and this appears to be the case. Ethnographic data are really hard to use because they were collected by different researchers at different historical moments under different conditions, different methods, different assumptions. As a result, we can only look for the most general patterns. And the general pattern is that warfare and violence are at least correlated with population pressure. Uh, here I've measured population pressure from a measure of primary production relative to population density. It's a rough measure of the amount of food available per person. And the warfare data come from the standard cross-cultural sample that Dr. Ember mentioned. It's variable 768 if you like that kind of stuff. Uh, and the data show that at high levels of population pressure, warfare is more common than at lower levels. And the same appears to hold true for general homicide rates. These dates, the data are quite messy, as they include both very careful field studies, such as those by Kim Hill and his uh, colleagues, and other just more general back-of-the-envelope uh, estimates. Some include deaths due to warfare, and some include infanticide, but others do not. Still, the general pattern seems to be that homicide rates are high at high levels of population pressure. When there's a lot of people relative to the food base, hunter-gatherers fight. And really, there's nothing remarkable uh, in that. Violence may not be human nature, but wanting to survive is. If you put anyone between a rock and a hard place, they'll fight, whether they're hunter-gatherers or university faculty. Okay, so the ethnographic data are messy. 
Does archaeology provide any clue as to the conditions of warfare? Did our most ancient ancestors find themselves between a rock and a hard place often? The earliest best evidence of warfare comes from the 13,000-year-old site of Jebel Sahaba in northern Sudan. And the evidence is pretty clear. All the pencils you see in this photo are not the result of a sloppy uh, excavator. Instead, each points to a stone projectile tip embedded in one or the other of these two unfortunate individuals. And there were 24 such burials like that. This is war, or something close to it. But this site of Jebel Sahaba stands out precisely because it's a rare case. Uh, other studies find far less evidence of warfare in the, in the Paleolithic. And in fact, there's precious little of it until after the appearance of uh, agriculture, and in fact, after the appearance of state societies. I I'm sure Paleolithic hunter-gatherers got ticked off at one another, but war is a cultural behavior, and it appears rarely among prehistoric nomadic hunter-gatherers. Why? All hunter-gatherers periodically evaluate whether to help someone or pay the cost of not helping, which is the risk of retaliation. The prevalence of violence among hunter-gatherers has to do with how significant imbalances are between the population and their food supply, how frequently those imbalances strike, as we saw from Dr. Ember's work, uh, how widespread those imbalances are, and how easy it is for one group to help another, and also how likely it is that a host group will need their generosity to be reciprocated in the future. In other words, it entails a very complicated calculus. Warfare occurs among hunter-gatherers where population pressure is high, and also where key resources can be controlled by one group, such as a prime salmon fishing location. This is what much of the fighting on the Northwest Coast was really all about. And it occurs when the group controlling those resources has no need for the lesser resources controlled by others. For those who are shut out of the best places, violence may be the only answer in times of dire need. And so those who control key resources must now defend themselves. This situation kicks in a very complex cultural process um, that uh, Polly uh, Wiesner talked about that leads some societies to value bellicosity, to use generosity as a club, to compete for prestige, to lower the status of women as marriage is used uh, as a way to build alliances, and to occasionally come to blows. This set of traits is more prevalent among sedentary than among nomadic hunter-gatherers. Nomadic foragers are interdependent. They can't afford to upset one another, and they cope with occasional squabbles by moving and by continually building and negotiating alliances, like the woman Polly showed with all of the, the necklaces on her. Those are signs of who she is connected to. And so we see that warfare and violence has a lot to do with material conditions of life. It's not explained solely by human nature, whatever that is. And that's good news. Why? Well, you all probably came here today because you'd like to know how to solve problems like Syria uh, and the Ukraine and the hundred other places that are, that are troubled in the, in the world. Carta wants to know, how did humanity get to this state of affairs? You just want to know, can we eradicate warfare as we eradicated diseases like scarlet fever? Can your grandchildren live in a peaceful world? Any particular instance of state-sponsored violence is difficult to solve, to say the least. What hunter-gatherers teach me, though, is not to worry about human nature uh, as part of the problem, but to focus on the material conditions that lead us to warfare and violence. And hunter-gatherers tell us that isolation, imbalances in wealth and power, and client-patron relationships all increase the likelihood of violence. Interdependence, cooperation, equality of opportunity, and the free movement of people all decrease it. 
Anthropology teaches us the importance of looking at the data we have to reveal what factors shape the variation that is human life. And that's a more valuable scientific approach than debating essentialist ideas of human nature. Violence is one option, absolutely, but no more so than, than peace. We can look to hunter-gatherers for an answer to this question, but not because they tell us more about human nature, but simply because they are humans coping with universal human problems. Thank you. Thank you.